GBB Ministry broadcast. And we trust that some way, somehow, the Word of God will reach you wherever you are as you listen to the unfolding of God's Word. Today we look at a message entitled, Two Great Signs That Points to Salvation. Two Great Signs That Points to Salvation. Let us bow for prayer. Eternal God, our Father which art in heaven, we give you thanks and praise for your love and your kindness. We thank you, God, for redemption through Jesus Christ. As I stand to God to minister your word, I pray that you may stand by me. And as I speak, O oh Father, I pray that you may speak through me, that above my voice will be heard the voice of Jesus. At the end of me this message, O oh God, I pray that each one listening, O oh Father, will have a relationship with you, I pray, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Two great signs that points to salvation. From the moment Adam and Eve fell into sin, these have plunged the human race into serious problems. Up to this point, I do not think that not much people understand the depth of sin and where we are as human beings. But the good news is God understands our true condition as a human being. The Bible declares, the Bible declares in the book of Romans chapter number 5. What book did I just say? Romans chapter number 5, reading verse 12. The Bible says, Wherefore, by, as by one man sin, sin entered into the world. So the Bible is speaking about the sin of Adam. And the Bible says... For as by one man sin, sin entered into the world, and death, death by sin, and so death passed upon all, for all have sinned. So, as a result of Adam's transgression, the Bible is telling us that his transgression caused us to inherit this sinful nature, and this nature brings forth death. So sin enters, and, and we who were not present at the time of Adam have to pay, or, or we fall into this battle also, the battle against sin. In Romans chapter number 8, Romans 8, the Bible even go even deeper. Romans chapter 8, verse, reading verse 6 and verse 7. Romans is the book, chapter number 8, 6 and 7. Listen to what the Bible says. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, the carnal man is speaking about the man outside of Jesus Christ. The man that inherited this, this sinful nature. And so the Bible says, if we are carnally minded, it is death. And this is what the transgression of Adam and Eve has brought to this human family, this human race. In verse number 7, the Bible says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Now watch this now. We are not only in a world that is a sinful world. We, we did not only receive a, a sinful human nature, a sinful nature, a carnal nature, but the Bible is saying because of that nature, we are God's enemies. So the Bible says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it cannot be subject to the law of God, and neither indeed can it be. It is not subject to the law of God, and neither indeed can it be. So what's our condition? And this is what I'm saying, that not many people truly understand the condition of man, or the condition that man has found himself in because of the sin of Adam and Eve. The Bible says we came into this world, and we came as God's enemies and, and we are not subject to the will of God or to the law of God. And even if we want to, the Bible says the carnal man cannot be subject to the, to the law of God. And so this is a terrible condition. Imagine you hearing what the word said, but in your carnal mind, you just cannot uh, give in to this and you need help from above but the situation guess what Jeremiah makes the situation looks worse in the book of Jeremiah 
chapter number 17. What book did I just say? Jeremiah chapter number 17. Read in verse 9. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, The heart is deceitful above all things. And now the Bible is speaking about when the Bible says the heart here is speaking about the mind of man, the center, the center of decision making, the mind of man, that the one, the thing that controls our action, that controls our world, that controls our lifestyle. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That is our true condition outside of Jesus Christ. And all these words are res is a result of the sin of Adam and Eve. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. But the Bible did not stop there. Jeremiah, Jeremiah sort of put more weight on the matter. In Jeremiah chapter 13, and verse 25, 23, the Bible says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leper his spot? Now, here's the condition. The Bible in Jeremiah 17 makes it abundantly clear. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 says that the heart is wicked and desperately wicked. And, and, and now Jeremiah is saying that we are in that evil condition. We are in that wicked condition. And we cannot do nothing to save ourselves. And so he says, can the Ethiopian, big question, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leper his spot? Then may he also do good that are custom of doing evil. What is the Bible saying to us? What is the Bible saying to us as we try to understand the true condition of man? The Bible is saying that a man that is born in Ethiopia, a black man, cannot change the tone of his skin. Because you have to understand the Ethiopian, even if he, he was successful in bleaching his skin to appear bright, Understand that being black is not just about what you look like on the outside, but it's something that comes from the inside. You are black because it is embedded in your DNA. And the Bible is declaring that the Ethiopian cannot change who he is. What a terrible condition to find ourselves in as it relates to sin. And the Bible declares that the leper cannot change his spot. Now watch this now. Then neither... Neither can we, who are accustomed of doing evil, just turn and do good. What does the Bible say? The Bible is saying to us, you and I came into this world. We came with a nature that is against God. A nature that makes us God's enemies. And the Bible is saying that we do not have the power within ourselves to change ourselves. That's a terrible condition. Our heart is wicked. Our heart is desperate. We are in a lost condition, but we still can't do anything to change our condition. And I want to say at this point, I know somebody who can change us. His name is Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and sisters, the Bible gives us two great signs that points to our salvation. Are you hearing me? The Bible gives us two great signs that points to our salvation. In the book of Isaiah, what book did I just say? Isaiah chapter number 7. Isaiah is the book. The chapter number is 7. We're going to read verse 14. Our first sign. Our first sign. Isaiah is the book. The chapter number is 14. Listen to what the word of God says. The Bible says, Therefore, the Lord himself. Now watch this now. Watch this. We can't afford to miss this. The Bible is saying, Isaiah the prophet is speaking. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Now watch this. God is about to do something wonderful. God is about to do something great. And he did not trust this work to the angels. He did not trust this work to Moses or Abraham. He did not trust the work to any great man in the past. But the Bible is saying that God himself shall give us a sign. Watch this. Our first sign. God himself shall give us a sign. What is the sign? Behold, a virgin shall be conceived. Or a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, 
and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's the first sign. Now, as we talk about the work of God, the plan of salvation, the condition that man has found himself in, man needed a help because man could do nothing, as Jeremiah said, to help himself. And so God decided that he was gonna, he's gonna pull man out of this condition. The plan of salvation was laid from the foundation of the world. And so God now is about to give mankind a sign. And so the Bible says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Let's work this text a little bit. The Bible is saying that the sign that God is going to give to you that will point to salvation. The sign that God is going to give to you that he has a plan of redemption. A virgin, an untouched woman by men. She had no sexual intercourse. She will conceive and bring forth a son. Now you may ask, how is this possible? And my response to you is, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And so the Bible says that, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall be conceived and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The name Emmanuel is being interpreted God with us. I'm going to say this again. The name Emmanuel means God with us. So let's understand this great sign. First of all, we understand what it takes to bring forth a child into this world. It takes a male and a female. It takes egg and it takes sperm to come together to create a, 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 a to bring forth a child into this world. But God has a plan and God's plan is bigger than the plan of man. And God is about to do something different because he's pointing us to salvation. God's desire is to see each of us say God's desire is to see us live above sin. And so God is about to do something wonderful. And so God says, a virgin. Now why? A virgin is a question we may have to ask. Why a virgin? There were a lot of experienced murders, li murders living in the time of Mary. There were a lot of childbearing mothers in the time of Mary. But you got to understand that God loved to walk through pure vessels. In fact, God walks through pure vessels so that no one will confuse the work of man with the work of God. When God does something, God needs pure vessels to walk through. I'm saying to you, if you're going to be used by God, you got to be a pure vessel. But you cannot be pure on your own or by yourself. You need the power of God to cleanse you and to wash you and to make you pure so that God can walk through you. The name shall be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. So let's understand what's happening here. One, the virgin will conceive. No, that's a mystery. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. But she will bring forth a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God with us. So the person that was sitting in the womb of the virgin Mary was God himself. That's what the Bible is saying. That God himself was in the womb of Mary because the son shall be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. So when he came into this world, he was God walking the earth. God in the flesh, walking planet earth. The sign was fulfilled. And there is a reason why Jesus came to this world. The sign must be fulfilled. There is a reason why Jesus came into this world. Matthew is the book. We answer this question. Matthew is the book. What's the reason Jesus came to this world? Matthew chapter number 1. What book did I just say? Matthew chapter number 1. Read in verse 20 on to 23. Matthew is the book. Let's read the chapter number 1. 
From verse 20, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, but while he thought on these things, speaking about uh, Joseph, but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now watch this. The Bible confirms it again in the New Testament. Isaiah says that a virgin shall be conceived and bring forth a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And now God speaking in the New Testament, speaking to Joseph, he said, listen man, don't be afraid to take Mary for your wife because that pregnancy that is taking place there have nothing to do with her sleeping around with some other man, have nothing to do with her running around with some other man, but it's the work of God, is the power of God because God is about to send his son into this world to save us from sin. Can somebody say amen? And so the Bible says in verse number 22, now verse number 21, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Now we gotta get this stuff. The Bible declares in Isaiah at chapter number seven and verse 14, that God is gonna give us a sign, a sign that will point to our salvation. And now Matthew here is explaining the sign to us. The Bible says, his name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus came into this world to save us, not in our sins, but from our sins. I'm going to repeat that stuff. Jesus came into the world to save us, not in our sins, but from our sins. Now, let me explain something to you. If you are in the water, or maybe in the sea or in the river or some pool of water, and you are drowned in, if somebody come to save you, they must take you out of the water to be safe. As long as you're in the water, you are in danger because the water was killing you. The same goes with sin. We cannot be saved in our sin, but from our sin, which means that the relationship that we once had with sin must be broken for us to experience the salvation of Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen? The relation that we have with adultery, the relation that we had with fornication, the relation that we had with lying and stealing and homosexuality, those must be broken by the power of Jesus if we're going to experience the salvation of Jesus. And so the Bible says, his name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Now watch this, the Bible, the Bible continues. And the Bible says in verse number 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted God with us. The angel said to Joseph, Mary is going to bring forth a son, and his name shall be called Jesus. He shall save his people from their sin. And I'm saying if you are one of God's people, you're not supposed to be in sin right now because Jesus would have done a work, the work of salvation many years ago on your behalf so that you can receive freedom from sin. I'm saying to you, you cannot live in sin. Uh, you should no longer live in sin when there is a sin pardoning a savior. And his name shall be called Emmanuel. In the book of Luke, what book did I just say? Luke chapter 1, watch this now. The story continues. The great sign that point to salvation. Luke is the book, chapter number 1, reading verse 28. And we, we read maybe a few verses here of scripture. Luke chapter number 1, reading from verse 28. 
Here is what the Bible says. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. And while she saw him, and when she saw him, she was troubled and saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation is this. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Now the Bible declares, uh, the Bible declares in Isaiah that God says, I'm going to give you a sign. A virgin shall be conceived and bear a son. And his name shall be called Emmanuel. God with us. God with man. In, in Matthew chapter number 1. The angel spoke to Joseph. And the angel said to Joseph. She shall be conceived. And she shall bear forth, bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. Could I tell you that this is the sweetest name that you will ever mention. This is the sweetest name that you will ever hear. Because Jesus came into this world to save us from our sin. Jesus came into this world to bring salvation to mankind. And so now the angel was speaking to Mary. And here's what the angel said to her. Thou have found favor with God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know, I don't know about you, but it's a good thing to find favor with God. It's a good thing to find favor with God. What made Mary different from the other women in Israel at the time? What made Mary different from the other virgins in Israel at the time? I would not know the, I may not know the answer to this, but what I know is that she found favor with God and was given the awesome responsibility to bring forth the Son of God into this world. Ladies and gentlemen, you may not be a Mary, but God has given to each of us an awesome responsibility to tell others about the love of Jesus Christ. And so here the Bible is speaking to Mary. The Bible says you have found favor in verse number 24. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be? Seeing I know not a man. Now Mary, although she was a virgin, understood that for a child to come into this world, or for a woman to become pregnant, you need the sperm of a man and the egg of a woman. For a, a child to come into this world, Mary is saying, this cannot be. I have never been with a man. I have never had sexual intercourse with a man. How is it possible that this is going to happen? But Mary did not understand. It was a sign spoken of way back in the time of Isaiah that God is going to give a sign that will point to our salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible declares that Jesus, the Bible declares that there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Now watch what the Bible says. If you think that the sign was not fulfilled, watch what the Bible says in 1 John. Chapter number 1 and verse 9. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The sign was pointing that a virgin will bring, be, be conceived and bring forth a son. His name shall be called Emmanuel. His name shall be called Jesus, which will bring salvation. The sign was pointing to the salvation plan, fulfillment of the salvation plan, Jesus coming into this world. And the Bible is now saying in 1 John that the sin-pardoning Savior is saying to us, if we confess, now watch this, the flip side to this is, if we do not confess, 
then we receive no forgiveness. But the Bible makes it clear, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's stay with this text a little bit. If we confess our sins, Jesus, Emmanuel, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, now watch this. Listen to this preacher. Listen to this preacher. I don't know what life you're living. I don't know what sin you have committed over your years and even committing now. I don't know how far gone you are into sin. But what I do know is there is still salvation in Jesus. What I do know is there is still power in the name of Jesus. What I do know is there is still pardon and power in the blood of Jesus. Somebody says that the blood of Jesus will never lose its power. Jesus is saying it doesn't matter what sin you have committed. If you come to me in true confession, if you come to me, I can forgive you. I will forgive you and I will cleanse you from all all unrighteousness what a sweet and powerful savior we saw so watch this now we can name sins what are you guilty of what sin are you guilty of are you guilty of lying are you guilty of child molestation are you guilty of rape are you guilty of, of stealing are you guilty of adultery are you guilty of fornication are you guilty of sabbath breaking are you guilty of of, of, of murder are you guilty of covetousness are you guilty of homosexuality i'm saying to you whatever your sin is or whatever your sins may be there is still power in the name of jesus can somebody say amen there is still forgiveness in the name of jesus because the sign that the virgin will bring forth a son is pointing to our deliverance and deliverance have come Deliverance have come. Ladies and gentlemen, now, there is another sign that points to our salvation. There is another sign that points to our salvation. We go to the book of Ezekiel. What book did I just say? Ezekiel is the book. The chapter number, Ezekiel chapter number is 20. Ezekiel chapter number 20. Let's hear what the word of God has to say. Or the, the second sign that points to our salvation. Ezekiel chapter number 20. Reading from verse 11. The Bible says. And I gave them my statutes. And, my, and show them my judgment. Which if a man do. He shall even live in them. So watch this. Our first sign says. That a virgin shall bring forth a son. His name shall be called, everybody, Emmanuel. His name shall be called, everybody, Jesus, because he's going to save his people from their sin. That's the first sign that points to our salvation, our redemption. Now, the Bible is giving us a second sign that points to our deliverance. The Bible says, God says, I gave them my statue. And the word statue here means a permanent rule. Hey, listen, God's rule is permanent. Can I hear somebody say amen? God's rule is permanent. You, see, you understand? Man make rules and man break rules and man change rules. But the rules that God has laid down to govern this universe, the rules that God has laid down to govern our life, uh, uh, God's rules remain permanent because Jesus remains permanent. And the only way we can have salvation is through Jesus Christ because the plan of salvation is permanent. And so the Bible continues. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign, to be what everybody? A sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. Now let's, let's, let's put this message together. The two signs 
that points to our salvation. And so the first sign says that the virgin, a virgin, shall, bring, shall be conceived and bring forth a son. And his name shall be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. And when God is with us, ladies and gentlemen, that's a good thing. It's a good thing to have God with you. When God is with you, you, you have peace. When God is with you, you have contentment. When God is with you, you have joy. Even though the world is full of trouble, when God is with you, you can still smile. And now the Bible says, Moreover, I gave them myself to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. Now watch this now. Watch this. Sabbath. Sabbath is not just about coming out to worship. Sabbath is not just about coming out to a holy convocation. Sabbath is not just out at another day of the week. Sabbath is not just another day that says, listen, let's go to church. No, no. The Bible says that God has given the Sabbath. And when we observe the Sabbath, the Bible says it's going to be a sign that God is the one that sanctifies us. Now I can ask you a question or two. Are you, are you sanctified? There are a lot of people who claim that they are saved and sanctified. My question to you is, what's your sign to show that you're saved and sanctified? Now watch this. Let's understand this text. Moreover, also, I gave them my Sabbath, my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. Now we need to understand the word, the meaning of the word sanctified. But before we understand the meaning of that word, let's go to the book of Genesis. What book did I just say? Genesis. We go to the book of Genesis. We're going to read chapter number 2. Genesis is the book. The chapter number is 2. And we're going to read from verse 1. Genesis is the book. Chapter number 2, the Bible says in Genesis, chapter number 2. Reading from verse number one, the Bible says, Thus the heavens and the earth was finished. Now God is the one that created this vast universe. The Bible says when God created this world, there was a beginning and there was an end of his creation. And so now Genesis is giving the account of the creative work of God. And so the Bible says that the, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. In other words, God completed his work of creation. So he continues to say, and all the hosts of them. So everything that needed to be in the world, everything that God, should I say this way? Everything that God wanted in this world, God would have already put it in place. And so now God is taking on a different line. God is about to do something wonderful after his creation. And the Bible says, and on the seventh day, what day it is? The seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he has made. And watch this now. The Bible says in verse number three, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Here comes the word again. And sanctified it because in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and sisters, this is the word of God. The Genesis account is telling us that one, it was God that created this vast universe. It was God that created this vast universe. And not only that, the Bible declares on the seventh day, God rested. God is, was, and will forever be a Sabbath keeper. Because it was God that instituted the Sabbath. You didn't hear me, so I'm going to say it again. It was God 
that instituted the Sabbath. The, the Bible said that God won, blessed the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, and sanctified that day. So God blessed the Sabbath day and he sanctified. Now we need to work the word sanctified. Now there are many different definitions from the word, for the word sanctified. I want us to look just at, at a few of them. Now the word sanctified, one, means to set apart. To set apart or to declare holy. You didn't hear me, so I'm going to say it again. The word sanctified means to set apart or to declare holy. So now let's go back to our second sign. The Bible says, uh, the Bible said in Exodus chapter number 20 and verse 12, that I gave them, God speaking, I gave them my Sabbath, that they may, as a sign, that they may know I am the Lord that sanctified them. So if the word means uh, to set apart or to, de or to, or to declare holy, the Bible is saying that you and I are set apart by God when we accept him, when we accept his Sabbath truth, we are set apart by God and God declares us holy. I want this thinking a little bit. I want this thinking a little bit. Because there is no holiness outside of God. There is no holiness. I'm going to say this again. There is no holiness outside of Jesus Christ. And so God set apart the Sabbath day and declared the Sabbath holy. In the book of Ezekiel, God speaking to the prophet says, I give you my Sabbath. If you accept my Sabbath, and everyone will know I am the Lord that sanctify you. I am the Lord that set you apart. Could I just speak to Seventh-day Adventists for a moment? Or if you think that Sabbath keeping is only about coming to church on a Sabbath. If you think that Sabbath keeping is just about putting on your best clothes and coming down and worship and coming down to sing or to clap your hand or to do what you do in church, you better think again. The Sabbath is saying that we are declared holy by God, that we are set apart. Now set apart for what purpose? Is the next question we need to ask. Set apart for what purpose? Now, ladies and gentlemen, when you accept Jesus Christ, there should be, there is a great change that takes place. Now, understand this preacher very carefully. Now, watch this. You can come to worship on the seventh day, on the seventh day, but you are not set apart. Listen to me very carefully. You can come to worship on the seventh day, on the Sabbath day, but you are not declared holy. Now watch this. When we live all through the week a reckless life, when we live all through the week a careless life, live in sin all through the week, Sabbath does not make us holy. God is the one that makes us holy by our union with Him. God cleanses us from all our sins and pronounces us holy. And I'm saying to us, we need to be holy. Jesus says, Jesus says, be also holy as your father in heaven is holy. We need to have the character of Jesus Christ. Now there is another definition for the word sanctified. There is another definition for the word sanctified. It means to purify and to cleanse. Now watch this. The word sanctified also means to purify and cleanse. So I'm saying to us that we need to accept Jesus. When we accept Jesus, 1 John 1 9 says, He will, if we confess our sins, He will cleanse us from all our sins and He will pronounce us His people. And now sanctification takes place. And so God wants to make us purify, God wants to cleanse us. I'll need to. I need to address seven Adventists this moment, my brothers and sisters. We got to understand that we are supposed to be pure vessels for God. You didn't hear that stuff, so I'm going to say it again. We are supposed to be pure and clean vessels for God. We got to understand that God works through pure vessels. 
as he walked through the Virgin Mary. Nobody understand this preacher. I'm going to say it again. That God walks through pure vessels and clean vessels as he walked through Mary. And I'm saying to you, of our own Jeremiah say, we can do nothing to clean ourselves, but thank God for the grace of God. Thank God for the power of Jesus Christ. The Bible declares that where sin abound, grace much more abound. So you can find grace in Christ and God can set you apart for special use. So how important is the Sabbath? How important is the Sabbath? Exodus. What book did I just say? Exodus. Chapter number 20. Exodus 20. We're going to read from verse number 8. Watch what the Bible says. The Bible says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. I'm going to say it again and I want every listener to hear this. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of God. The Bible declares that the seventh day is God's Sabbath. No, the seventh day is not Adventist Sabbath. The seventh day is God's Sabbath. The seventh day is not man's Sabbath, but the seventh day is God's Sabbath. But when man accepts the salvation plan of Jesus, God gives man a Sabbath so that he can come out and have holy convocation and remember his creative work in the beginning. Notice very carefully that the Sabbath is God's Sabbath. There are a lot of things that we do and Sabbath that does not belong to God. And it's a crying shame. When we take the Sabbath and dedicate it to the highlighting of the creature, we have desecrated the Sabbath. The, the Sabbath is about the creator and not the creature. This is one of the reasons why, as a child of God, there are some things I do not partake on on the Sabbath day. Now I have no problem if you claim that you want to honor your mother or honor mothers or honor fathers. But I'm saying a Sabbath day is not a day for us to honor a father and mothers on these days. The Sabbath day is not to honor a preacher. Sabbath day is to honor God. Sabbath is about the creator and not the creature. And hence the reason why we got to be careful with the things that we do and the things that we say on the Sabbath. Our conversation must be in line of Sabbath keeping if we are going to keep Sabbath holy. So God says, the Bible said, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, thy male servant, nor thy cattle that is with uh, the stranger that is within thy gate. Now watch this, watch this, because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the, the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now there is something we need to say before we close this message here. There are some things we need to say. The Bible says, the Bible says that in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Watch what the Bible says now. In verse 10, the Bible says, in the Sabbath, the instructions that was given to mankind, in the Sabbath, thou shalt not do any work, any work that does not pertain to the salvation of man or the rescue of mankind. We should not do them. So your regular work that you do during the week, you should not do that work on the Sabbath day. Well, except you're a doctor that take care of people. I'm saying to us, I'm saying to us that our regular work should not be done on the Sabbath. Now watch this, the Bible says, neither your son nor your daughters. Now watch this. Could I speak to Adventist parents for a while? 
There are a lot of our Adventist parents who come out to worship on God's Sabbath day, but the children is at home doing their own thing. Watch this now. The Bible says on that day, neither you nor your son nor your daughter nor your manservant, your male servant, nor your the stranger that is within your gate, the stranger that come to sojourn with you, the stranger that come to visit you. If you are a true Sabbath keeper, when strangers come to you, when Sabbath come around, they will be with you welcoming the Sabbath. When Sabbath comes around, they will be with you in church on Sabbath. You cannot leave your house open so your children and your servants and your and the strangers to do as they please. If you are doing that, then you are in strict violation of the law. It is sad, however, that sometimes standing in the pulpit, presenting God's word, are men and women preaching to others Asking us to be holy, asking us to keep God's Sabbath day while the children at home doing what they feel like. I'm saying it's about time that we have a Sabbath reform. And my brothers and sisters, those of you who, who do not belong to the seven day Adventist church, the Sabbath is not about Adventists, but the Sabbath is about God. The Sabbath is about God, and God says to remember it. God says to remember it. Ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and sisters, there is a blessing when we observe God's Sabbath. Here's what Jesus says as it relates to obedience to Him. Here's what Jesus says in the book of Matthew. In the book of John, sorry, John chapter number 14. The Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now watch this. The Sabbath is a part of or one of God's commandments. And so Jesus is saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. Watch this. The flip side is, if you don't love God, you will not keep his commandments, including the Sabbath. So then God cannot pronounce you holy. God cannot pronounce you uh, set apart because you bluntly refuse to keep his Sabbath. Now, if you did not know, it's a different story. But when you know about the Sabbath, God expects you to keep his Sabbath. In the same book of John, chapter number 15 this time, here's what Jesus says. Jesus says in verse 14, You are, ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I have commanded you. Can somebody say amen? Now, don't you want to be a friend of God? Don't you just want to love God and live for God? God is saying, you are my friend. If you do whatever I command you, including keeping the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath, Jesus says, is a sign to show that I am the Lord that sanctify you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I love the God I serve. I love the God I serve. The God I serve is a God of a second chance. The God I serve is a merciful God. The God I serve is a God that is willing to see everybody saved and nobody perish. But you and I need to make a decision. The Bible says in Isaiah, God is pleading to our hearts. God is pleading to us. God says in Isaiah chapter number 1 and verse 16, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from among my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widows, come now. The call of Jesus is to come now. And let us reason together. Let's talk about the plan of salvation. Let's talk about the things that you do not understand. Let's talk about the things that seems complicated. Let's talk about the things that you want to do but do not have the power to do them. Let's talk about the sins that you have committed. I'm going to cleanse you. I'm going to wash you. Uh, Jesus is saying, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God is giving us a second chance 
another opportunity to be his people another opportunity to be his friends another opportunity to be among those that will be going to the kingdom of god the two signs that point to our salvation is that god that a virgin shall be conceived and bring forth a son and shall call his name emmanuel meaning god with us or jesus he shall save us from our sins and the second sign is that god has given us his sabbath to show that is a sign that he is the one that sanctifies us now maybe you haven't been keeping god's sabbath because maybe you have not heard about god's sabbath but today is a good day to start today is a good day to start or maybe you have been keeping sabbath but falling away god is saying you can start today or maybe you come to church and sabbath but you're not really keeping Sabbath because to keep Sabbath, you have to, you must have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not about the clothing. It's not about the coming together. It's not about the size of the temple. It's not about the, con the way we conduct the worship. It's about our relationship with Jesus Christ. And if we do not have a relationship with Jesus, we cannot keep Sabbath holy. In fact, could I quickly say, if we do not have a relationship with our our brothers and sisters we are not keeping Sabbath holy but God in Isaiah is saying come now who want to say today who want to say today preacher listen I want a new start I accept the two signs that God have bring salvation through Jesus Christ and God have given us the Sabbath by the way we got to understand you don't keep Sabbath to be saved but you keep the Sabbath because you are saved and sanctified by Jesus Christ. Because you are set apart. Because you have been washed. Because you have been cleansed by God. You will keep the Sabbath holy. And it is possible to keep God's Sabbath holy. What do you want to say today? I want to start today keeping God's Sabbath day holy. If you want to say that today, why not bow with us as we pray? Eternal God. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the two signs that points to our salvation. Jesus shall come in the form of man through a woman and deliver us from our sins, those of us who accept him. And he will give and he have given to us the Sabbath as a sign that we have accepted him and we are sanctified and set apart. We want to say today to you, God, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for all that you have given to us. Now we ask you for saving power. I pray for that young man, that young woman, that senior man, that senior woman, that boy, that girl that is listening to this broadcast right now who have a problem in understanding the plan of salvation. Let them know, God, that the plan of salvation is real and it is simple. Jesus came into this world to save us from our sin, not in our sin, from our sin. And if we confess our sin, it doesn't matter what sin we have committed, Jesus will forgive us once we are sincere. We thank you, God, for your love. Continue to bless again this ministry that we may reach the unreached for you. That one of these good days when heaven shall bust and Jesus shall come forth. That all of us, those who we are working with, those who we are praying for, and those of us who are a part of this ministry, even this preacher, all of us will be saved in your eternal kingdom, I pray. Thank you again for hearing and thank you for answering in Jesus' holy name. Let everybody say amen and amen.